thank you for, thank you for chatting it's like it's one of those like obviously i think the pandemic has affected everyone in both a similar way and a completely different way but i think one of the nice things is is i think everyone's become very comfortable of talking online face to face which i think like pre covid days if someone had said oh let's have a chat about photography or anything and like just look at each other's faces on a screen it would seem really strange like even like skype it's like it's funny how these things change so rapidly but it's like yeah i mean you're calling from singapore and it's it's pretty it's both connected and very disconnected at the same time at the moment how 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 have you, how have you found it where you are uh, to be honest i'm i'm quite grateful to for the chance to be connected with like peers in the photography scene beyond singapore it's like a reminder that my world is bigger than where i am right now so that that's great yeah. i mean I'm 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 slightly ignorant in terms of of, of Singaporean photography scene. What what's what's the photography scene like where you are? Uh, I I don't know. I I, I, I sometimes I feel I'm 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 in a little bit of a weird position. I like the photographers. They may see me as more like visual artists, uh, and then some visual artists see me as more like photographers. Um, I'm not really sure. But anyway, um, but, um, when it comes to photography in Singapore, there are a couple of um, main uh, centers, main kind of hotspots, if you like. Um, and one of this is like um, objectives, uh, and the other one is called that. And objectives is quite, uh, they do quite a lot of education on the ground, community engagement, um, which is great. And I started off a little bit from there, actually. And, and the other one is called DEC, and they, they organize like the Singapore International Photography Festival. So um, they are, they're probably a little bit more, they, I mean, they organize like more international events. Okay. But yeah, yeah, they, they, they go to these festivals like OWL and all that. Yeah, so we, we have two main organizations here that are like mainstays in photography. And, you, and you've also started something else of your own, is that right? You're part of a kind of a collective, is that right? Uh, okay, yeah, that kind of, that, that isn't a, that's not exactly a collective, but it's a platform. We started it during COVID actually. Um, I, uh, so when I just came back from the UK, I was trying to readjust to life back here in Singapore, which is quite fast paced, productivity driven, very urbanized and all that. And my friend, uh, she just came back from Chiang Mai. So she's a farmer and she's also trying to readjust back. So we decided to start a platform to advocate for a slower pace of life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just form a community of sorts. And what we do is we organize events related to finding posts in our everyday. It's not exactly photography or arts with necessarily art related, but um, so far we did like uh, meditation events, mm -hmm. journaling, online journaling, uh, and we did a residency at Objectives as well. Very nice of the founder, co-founder to invite us. Um, so for the residency, we gathered a few artists who whose um, practices align, like the, the same teams. They may deal with different mediums. Like one is a filmmaker, the other one is a painter, one is a dancer, movement artist, and all that. But within the residency, we decided to skill swap to learn from each other, uh, different approaches, and in a way, um, take the pressure off having to produce anything, mm -hmm. but focus on the process of learning from each other instead. So you think so? So this was something that was born out of out of the pandemic. Or yeah. you write it before. I mean, that's, I think certainly here in the UK, I've seen that everyone very quickly learned how to make sourdough bread. Like it was like everyone was like desperate to like learn a, a new skill. I'm a big fan of kind of cross disciplinary art and kind of, I think oftentimes as photographers, we, we think that photography, like the end of the world is the photographer's gallery and that there's nothing else beyond that. 
and it's kind of when you kind of open your eyes to different forms of either visual communication or any kind of form of art you kind of go oh jesus it's so small photography your i mean from what i understand of your practice is it's incredibly um not that not that there's a performance element to it but it's it's so hands-on I've, I've heard from members of staff at ue that 90 percent of your time was spent in the dark room kind of like creating like the physicality of an artwork and, and i think that something that i feel is often lost now is in, in in the art of photography is that idea of producing something that's physical or some you, there's a kind of a, a tactileness tactfulness of, of, of an object would you be able to kind of talk about your like your process what kind of what kind of work interests you and what kind of your your portfolio like what it's concerned with um what kind of work interests me uh i think I, I think you're very right that materiality plays a big part in my work and the technology is important for me like for say my eyes work, with the weight of air the book if you have seen it um it's not it's trying to get people to not just see the landscape but also to touch the landscapes and that's why the pages certain chapter breaks are of different thickness um uh even the 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 front leaf right is made from a certain fabric so it is and and the colors um of the chapter breaks of the front leaf and end leaves they are they resemble certain elements in the landscapes in iceland so um, and the thread that there is used to stitch the the book is light blue, and so that is like the color for me that uh, represents the emotion that tie the work, the images together. Um, and 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 I mean, I wish I could show you. Better. I was just thinking, I'll share my screen, and then we can uh, we can talk talk about it together. Oh my god! Like I haven't updated my <laughs> website for a long time. <laughs> Do you know, it's funny, it's, uh, this is another thing that I think everybody's guilty of. When the pandemic started, everyone said they were going to digitize their archive and everyone said they'll work on their website. And we just got sidetracked. And I think it's fine. I mean, I like your website is kind of like a combination of a blog and like a portfolio. It's like, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of presenting work. The, it's called The Weight of Air. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. So... Um, Iceland is a really interesting subject, I think, just in terms of talking about the landscape. But I talk, so, talk, so talk us through, how did, it, how did this work start? Uh, it's my first residency. And I, at, at a point in my life, I wanted to get away from Singapore. Um, and so someone invited me over, I went. Um, and for one, one month plus, I was just there wandering the landscapes. You know, it was the end of winter, beginning of spring. Um, I was just walking and shooting. And when I came back, uh, well, um, someone, a curator called Yumi Goto, she saw the work and then I applied for her workshop um, in Japan. And then I began to, to learn about bookmaking, learn about sequencing, uh, learn about storytelling through um, emotions uh, in open-ended way. So that's how the work started actually. Right, and the, the residency in Iceland was that is it air? Is there? There's. There's. Uh, is it the one in? Is it the one in Reykjavik or the one in north of Iceland? Ah, oh, it it was in north of Iceland. It's in Husavik. It's no longer around. But uh, I know the one you are talking about in Reykjavik. Uh, that that is quite a popular one, right? It's. I, I feel like you know the landscape itself has been like you know to borrow a Gem Seven book title is very much literally the painter's pool for so much creativity i think it's always like the starting point and iceland being like a volcanic nation like it's impossible not to be not to go to iceland and in some way make a body of work about the power of the landscape and its effect it's almost it's almost ethereal one of the things i liked about your presentation in the reykjavik museum of photography is the use of fabrics would you be able to kind of expand on on, on, on why i mean the idea of looking at a landscape but also looking through it I think is a really interesting concept. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you made a very, very, very good point. Like, I, I don't really want people to just look at the landscapes. I want to look, I want them to look through the landscapes and back to themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so that's one of the, the reason why I prefer translucent cloth fabric in, in this case. And I think I started off by looking at the qualities in the image when I, when I edit, like perhaps, you know, like sense of etherealness or whatever. And then I try to translate that into how I present the work. Um, in recovery, it was like through the use of fabric. In Singapore, it was through projections. Um, but the fabric I chose um, at UV actually, uh, it has a, it's, it's silk-like, a slight sheen. Uh, it, it's a, I thought it has a little bit of a dreamy quality, uh, a character that I really want in, in, the, in my work and in the presentation. So that, that was how it began. And the space um, is the ex outer space, of, it's not the main hall. Okay. Um, yeah, the walls were slightly curved. And, and as such, I thought, you know, it would be nice to respond to the space itself and present it um, in a way that the fabrics are curved as well. It's not just flat because flat is almost like an obstacle, like, right? Like, you're, like a canvas, like, mm -hmm. like it's obstructing. But when you curve it, it's a little bit more inviting as if it's um, asking the, the viewer or the audience to walk through the fabric, like they're walking through the landscapes. I mean, the I guess for those that haven't ever seen the space in the Reykjavik Museum of Photography, yeah, it, it's the it's a really weird space that you have straight walls, but you have very curved walls, and um, it's as kind of unique as the uh, as the landscape itself. I think one of the nice things about maybe using silk as well as or silk like material is it has an element of like luxury to it, and I think like throughout art art history or just history, the landscape has been something which the rich genuinely have enjoyed. And it's kind of all of these kind of questions and just in the presentation of the work, I think is, yeah, I think it's really fascinating. And again, Yumi Goto, who is kind of like the photo book messiah, I would say everybody kind of, Yumi is one of the, one of the biggest collectors, but also kind of um, supporters of the photo book as an art form. And she runs this workshop, which you did in, in Japan. What was that process like trying to visualize something that, is tactile and, and physical and almost like an experience itself like the show and then trying to distill that into a into a book yeah I, well okay i mean the the work first took form of a book and i wanted it to be a book because there's this one-to-one -one relation right like uh the the work itself is personal as, as i'm sure you can tell but so i wanted like a viewer to intimately to engage with the work in a more intimate manner. And the book being this one-to-one -one, um, format encourages that. Um, when, I, when, I was, when I went to Yumi Goto um, space, um, she was teaching it with Tuan and Sandra. Okay. Uh, yeah, they're, they're from Amsterdam. Uh, so I was the least experienced there actually. So I was surrounded by well, very um, impressive bookmakers. So I was just playing catch up most of the time. <laughs> but it's amazing. I mean, I learned a lot from them. And we started off by, you know, just again, sequencing on the wall. Um, then we went together to a, to a mega bookstore, picking out fabric and, you know, picking out papers, different, different types of materials. Um, of course, Twin, Sandra, Yumi, the company us giving suggestions. Then. Over the span of two weeks, I think we, we did mock-ups before we returned back to class and then present the different mock-ups and then gathering feedback. And after the whole workshop, we returned to our home countries mm -hmm. um, and, the, and it continued online. Um, so the workshop wasn't, the physical workshop wasn't like um, once it's done, it's done. It would, the, the, the learning uh, kind of extended into the digital um, format, yeah. And then, so what what year was this then? This is pre COVID, I'd imagine. Yeah, it's pre COVID. Uh, it is around 2016, 2015, I think. I think yeah. it's as one of the. I mean, I've always watched from afar the kind of workshops that Yumi does, and I and I feel like it's like a photographer's paradise is to go into her collection of books and also just to be able to turn to experts like her. And I think they had Jan do it a couple of years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty just, it's a pretty phenomenal, like almost boot camp for photography. Um, 
And so how many copies of this did you make? Uh, 90. 90 copies. Wow. Yeah. Stitch, hand stitch. I think I'll never ever make such a big edition again. Really. <laughs> I was going to say, 90 hand stitch books are, are, are pretty amazing. And they all come in the fabric, which I think is really lovely. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm just going to do this then. So certainly when you were at um, UWE, um, you, you studied the, the master's here. Was that when you were working on this or was it before you leave? Uh, me, before you leave. I don't work. <laughs> okay, we, we won't talk about before we leave. So, so this, no. this is this is I feel um, where you kind of got your reputation for for living in the dark room is is making this kind of work. Um, uh, yeah, poor technicians. <laughs> poor technicians. Yeah, I, I feel I feel like we're still recovering. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, in terms of in terms of like, there is there seems to me like there's a. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's kind of a, if it's a Singaporean thing, or, but certainly there's themes that come out in Japan as well. But like, I'm thinking of um, Dai, uh, God, Daisaka, no, Dai, Daisuke. Yeah, Daisuke, uh, Daisuke, I forgot his last name. But I forgot his last name too. But there's also, um, you know, like there's Thomas Savan from, um, who's French, but lives in China, is doing the gold mine, uh, silver mine, Beijing silver mine. And then there's also Kenko Koi. There seems to be a, a kind of a, a refocus to the physicality of an object. But I think that there's a kind of a preciousness being um, reinstated to the photographic technique, but also the photographic print that I think is really interesting. And it certainly comes across in your work. And like, how would you describe, firstly, what the project is about, but then kind of maybe to go into some details as, as to how you were trying to visualize that through your technique? Uh, I think for me, the project is about relooking at the nature that surrounds us at the, at the time. And because all these were made from like, you know, soil, flowers, leaves, um, things like that. Uh, things that are easily passed by and, and burn out. It's like when we look at landscapes, we think of the spectacular, right? The big, beautiful thing. But how about the little, little things? You know, how about the, the dirt where our, te our feet is touching? How about the, 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 the wind that is just caressing our, our cheeks? All these things, all these like, all these like precious uh, moments that actually remind us of our own body in a way. So this work is, uh, well, I'm, I, I'm hoping that it could call for a relooking at this more bits of organic matter. Um, and as you can tell, the vocabulary it adopts is also, you know, of um, geological phenomena, cosmological, and all that. And these are, I guess, symbols that have across time and culture um, uh, evoke uh, associations with the divine, with, with the transcendent, transcendental, or you know, the big whatever, right, the unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I just, I just, I guess, like, I wanted through the project to to. Kind of get people to to wonder, to wonder a little bit, to see like how mm, small macro stuff, um, micro stuff could 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 seem a little bit magical as well. Yeah. So the the concept is not that complicated, I guess. Yeah. And it's called yeah, it's it's called myth because um, I wanted people to think about creation myths. Um, and I like the word myth because it has this ambiguity, right? It, it, it's almost like it's arbitrary, fake and all that, the associations. But in sociology or anthropology, myth, the word is also something that is just referencing a story, a worldview. It has no, it takes no position on whether it's real or not. So I, I like the ambiguity and I thought that plays a lot with some of my images in that. Um, yeah, it's not in the in between. <laughs> it's funny, I mean, like that description of myth, I, I feel, could be applied to photography in general. It's the idea that it's 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 both factual and inaccurate, and truthful and deceitful. I I love the idea of reimagining something into beauty. Um, certainly, things that are taken for granted, and I think there's a kind of I'm not sure if it's because the project itself is quite ethereal or. But or, or maybe print the alternative processing and printing of it. 
it kind of reminds me of Sal Caprotic and Katrin Koning's work, the uh, Ashton Mars. Um, it's kind of like yeah. there, 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 there is almost like a there's a there's a foot in reality, but the rest is kind of up for interpretation. Um, yeah. Oh my, I'm I'm a fan of uh, Katrin Koning. <laughs> I I really love that book. This, but there's some there's something almost uh, astronomical about this work. You don't. It doesn't. It's grounded in the real, but it's. Uh, you could say to me, this photograph, for example, this print is of solar flares uh, in the sun, and it's like I would completely believe that. But there's a kind of a. I don't know. There, there, there seems to be a kind of a connection with with everything in this work. I think. And 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 as a, in terms of an output, then for this project, was this made into an exhibition or a book? Yeah, if you want, I could share the um, uh, the exhibition that just went down like recently. Yes, please, that'd be lovely. I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, let me see, where is it? Just give me a, a moment. Okay. We can edit this part out. <laughs> yeah, the, the bit where I struggle like, to find my files. No, but it's fine, it's fine. Just give me an hour. Yeah, one hour later. <laughs> uh, I can't share because you're the host. Could you, could you maybe oh, just uh, allow me to share? It's your account. I'm so sorry. I've taken over. <laughs> uh, okay, wait. Ah, okay. Could you see? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, let's see. Enter full stream. Okay, so anyway, um, so I did an installation, mm. kind of floating frames. The frames were not, I mean, the prints were, were laid directly on the glass. There's no, uh, any, there's no glass covering them. Okay. Oops. And this, this, this is interesting. The, the idea of seeing through things again is like emerging as a theme, I feel. Um, uh, so you so you are like, like you're spotting all my tricks. <laughs> I'm, trying to di I'm trying to dissect the, uh, the, the concept. No, no, I mean, it's just, it's just a really, you know, we always, we always put something in front of a wall and the wall is the end point of all, you know, is the solid mass that frames our photographs. And I feel like, yeah, whether it's seeing through the landscape or seeing through the, 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 the I'm not sure what the correct word would be, but like the, the container of your well, prints, there just seems to be a, the, the bit of a lineage here that I'm, that I'm seeing. Mm. No, it's quite, that, I mean, that's, a, that's a quite a sharp uh, observation because sometimes I just want to immerse people, you know, and I feel like, with everything stuck on the wall, sometimes I feel a little bit restricted. Mm -hmm. Completely. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. It's just a small exhibition. And this was in Singapore. Yeah. Um, so, is at a space called Grey Projects, and they they gave me the the chance to go to a residency in Japan. So, yeah. So so the work I developed it there, although it started at UV. Uh, I kind of make more darkroom work, torture more people with my, with my hours. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, I came back and did the show. Mm. And so how, how, how does one then go from like creating an idea or some sort of concept and then figuring out, I want to try to incorporate that concept in the making process. So like, my question, I guess, in, in, in a simple way would be, how, how did the idea of this project originally take shape? And then at what point did you go, I'm kind of gonna go all in and think of everything I can for the physicality of, of the presentation of it? Yeah, that's quite a good question. Let me show you one image. Um, so you, if you, when I was in UWE at doing that Emmy, we were trying to, we have to do some project. Like, everyone has to do a project, right? And then I was printing on leaves on organic matter. Um, and then I was feeling a lot and things were just falling apart, literally. 
And uh, so it was end of winter, and then there were, I was running out of leaves in a way. So I decided to play with tree bark. So the image on the left is made from a tree bark, the cherry birch tree at Castle Park. Okay. Uh, so I found that um, by uh, kind of putting the tree bark into the, into the enlarger, instead of using the, 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 what do you call that? Putting a film into the enlarger, you put like things into it. Into it. I could kind of use it to reference uh, an ocean to me. And, and this play, right, this play with scale, this play with ambiguity is already in my images, uh, my photographs, so called, so to speak. And I thought like, this could be a, a way to develop my practice, uh, finding different approaches to explore the similar themes. Mm. So this image kind of pointed the direction for the whole project. And then I began to pick up more uh, organic matter experiments and all that. And that's how this um, uh, project came into being. And, and as you have pointed out, because of uh, the very analog process in which I work and the importance of tactility for me, right? It is important that, uh, that my work takes shape in the physical form. And in this case, either exhibition or the book, um, and I guess it is, uh, it is a lot of luck and people giving me opportunity that I have a chance to, to do it in the exhibition. Mm. Yeah. I think one of the things which is both beautiful, but also maybe I, I, I imagine is slightly frustrating in COVID era is the reliance of your work being seen physically. <laughs> and, and, and the, the inability of that. I also love the idea that, you know, you're using kind of his canvas, like bark or leaves, but the idea of these things having a shelf life because of nature or because of the brittleness of, of you know, that they've been taken away from, you know, whatever, whatever was keeping them sustained and alive. I like the, I, I like that relationship to how we maybe view kind of artwork in general. The idea that a negative or a photographic print at the very least in the dark room will live for 60 to 80 years before it starts to fade and it has a shelf life. Um, or the idea that a painting has to be restored and preserved because it's there's an artistry on it. And I like that you're building on the idea of yeah, leaves or bark or or you know, whatever, or I'm not gonna go into too much detail what other organic matters. I can imagine that there's hundreds, but like, yeah, there's something about that that I think is it there's there's a, there's a permanence to it, but there's also not, and I think as a concept, that's really that's really beautiful. Yeah, if you if you think about it, the, the exhibition format is also quite a transient format, right? Like mm. two weeks, one month, maybe max, and then it's gone. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you, I, yeah. You then photograph it digitally, and then it's some it's some it's some way like some way it's kind of permanent, but it's not. In a way, it's like um, it's. I, I would imagine it's the same of of, of people that do like Man Ray photograms. These kind of things that are like they're in the way of the photographic paper, and 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 there's a, some sort of permanence to it. But then they eventually will, because of them being light sensitive, decay, um, or like Polaroids, or any of these kind of. I don't know. I think photography. We often have the misunderstanding that it's a permanent form of art because because you know it references history but in terms of the physicality of it i don't necessarily think that that's that's necessarily the case the the, the, the idea of, of yeah um of decay i think is a really interesting theme within your work at least yeah is this passing our time i don't know i may sound too nostalgic but uh, it's like this passing of time, this decay of things, yet trying to still capture it, like a moment in which it's still alive. And then, well, and then that moment, that it cause passes again, and then it is gone, right? The actual object it is gone again. Ah, I don't know, I find it quite sad. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the part, for example, that you used as a kind of like a, the, the seascape in a way, was that attached to a tree when you first when you first found it, or what, what was it decaying? Uh, usually they are almost dropping out. I I I don't really deliberately pluck flowers or, or, or something. Usually they are on the floor on the ground, and I try to return them after I use them. 
Yeah. But, but I but I think that like yeah I I love the idea of like something in the autumn of its life natural in terms of nature is then being repurposed and somewhat living a much longer period of time because it's had some kind of interruption with the photographic process like you know that bark for example would have probably have just fallen and then turned into mulch and then you know been blown away and then now it's this kind of exhibited piece of art and you know in Singapore it's just there, there, there's a beauty to that I think that's kind of both I don't know I think that the, the strength of your work, but also it's it's the, the, the I think the concept and the execution are, are, are really well done. So. Thank you. I, I'm not sure if the tree bark feels the same. I, I it might you know. <laughs> we'll have to ask it. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So so I mean that fabled question that every artist hates is what I'm about to ask you. But what so what are you working on now? Oh, uh, I'm working on a film. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's a collaboration with a filmmaker. Uh, her name is Gladys Ng, and she she was one of the artists who joined me for the residency objectives. I got to know her through there actually, um, where we did a talk as well, and then we I realized we have a lot of um similarity, similar interests. Mm. Um. So this film is commissioned by uh, the National Gallery of Singapore. Um, and, and, and anyway, long story short, they, they are going to put up an exhibition of six artists um, who are prominent in the 60s, 70s, and they are inviting people to respond to it. So my friend and I, Gladys and I got invited. And of course we say yes, right? Uh, so we are going to um, make a film based on materials that the artist uh, in the exhibition has used, mainly fabric and paper. Uh, and the artist draws a lot of inspiration from nature as well. Um, and this is something which is already in my work. So um, Gladys and I are just walking around filming stuff, sometimes separately, sometimes together. And we are building a collection of clips and then we will see how it come together yeah i know it's a little bit vague no no i don't i don't know any project that's not vague at the start i think, that I think every project needs to be an abstract before it becomes something more concrete yeah i don't know i don't really know how you turn out but as a deadline draws nearer something will come up i think i, I mean again like I, I see a similarity to you responding to found pieces of, of nature that you then use in your work and then responding to someone's work in a, in a gallery like they're not too dissimilar practices in a strange way like they're, they're, there's a response that I think I mean in essence that is what art is it's just responding to things that you find and experience but the, your work it seems to be a little bit more focused focused in that and in a strange way I, I think that you've managed to in a pandemic Create, an, create a situation where with your collective and also working with Gladys that you're kind of responding to each other's practices as well as your own, which I think is going back to the first point of how people are so connected, but also so not connected. Um, yeah, it's, a really, it's really interesting. So when does that, when does that open? The uh, deadline for that? I think it, our deadline is June. Uh, I think the screening should be July. Okay, and can you can you see that online afterwards after the exhibition? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot the terms. I do hope it can be screened online, of course. Hmm. So, so if anyone watching wants to keep up with that, they, they just keep an eye on keep an eye peeled on the website. Yeah, I think so. If I update my website, yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's kind of a nice logical place to end there um oh before we end can i show you a, a work of course do you want to record it uh i don't know yeah we can record it Kill the, carry on please uh, okay give me another hour to find it <laughs> it's gonna be the longest <laughs> but thank god yeah thank god you've got a pro account <laughs> uh, okay. i just looked at the clock i was like oh wow we've managed to hit 30 minutes exactly that's like that's great because i have a tendency of rambling um, 
Oh, you need have a time limit? Was there a time limit? No, no, not at all. But I, 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 I heard, I, for some reason, I have the number 30 in my mind. So I was like, I hope, it's, I hope it is 30 and not an hour 30. Ah, oh my, <laughs> that's long. I don't, I don't have so much work. Uh, okay, okay, let me see. I just want to show you a work that was done after, well, after the, um, when restrictions ease up in Singapore. Um, it's not exactly photography. Uh, but there is a print, a light box, but yeah, okay, can you? I mean, can you? Could you see it? I can see, yeah, I can, I can, I can see it. So that's a that's a light box. Uh, there's a light box at the end. Um, uh, okay, wait, let me play it again. Maybe I'll. Just... I'm in a relatively bright attic, so I need to just turn ah, okay. things slightly. Okay. Anyway, could you hear anything at your side? Uh, some bang, some like it sounded like banging. Ah, that's a water droplets. Water droplets. Yeah. So if you note at the at the end of the corner of the room, that's a light box. And when you first enter the the the, the room, you see a puddle of light on the floor and reflections on the on the wall. Uh, I was trying to reconstruct an experience of a cave um, in Japan. Mm. And the sound, um, the sound of of water droplets uh, that you hear are, are actually from a block of ice that are hung above, uh, but you can see, of course, it's in the dark. Yeah, so the, the yeah, I don't know. So how, 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 so in the actual space itself, there's a, there's a block of ice in the, on the ceiling? Yeah. So how often do you need to change that ice? <laughs> Every three hours. Every, <laughs> and you need to make sure the temperature doesn't go up? Yeah, and I'm and I'm nothing. <laughs> I feel like I, I, it it completely makes sense as a, again following your lineage that you would have an immersive space that is both a cave but an artificial one of that. Um, where did this cave in Japan? Was that something that you found during your residency with uh, Yumi? No, it was a. Uh, I mean, this cave in Japan. Oh, could you hear the airplane? I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, you could hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. It's fine. It's not a problem, honestly. Oh, okay, okay. Um, this was this this is the residency that Grey Project sent me on, and I, and that was last year, just before COVID started. Um, when I came back, COVID started, and then we were just thrown into you know. Um, all the all the quarant um, quarantine, circuit breaker, lockdown, etc. But when I was in Japan, I was in this cave, which is not touristy at all. But it's so it's so I don't know surreal. Like it's, it's one of those caves where you you walk around in the dark with, with a touch light, and if you if you switch it off, you are just thrown into complete darkness. Mm -hmm. And in that cave, I I felt like fear. I felt um, but I could remember moments of calm. You know. That were, it, it was a little bit scary, like you know, low ceiling, walking through icy water, not knowing what was in front of me. But at some points, when everything is so dark and quiet, you could just reconnect with yourself somewhat. Right. And this work um, is supposed to take place in um, April, last April. But because of restrictions, we didn't. Um, and we postponed it to um, August, and this was at another space called Commerce Space. And when I went into the space, all the conception, all, all the project ideas that I had for the exhibition, the curator and I kind of decided not to do it instead, because uh, I was really intrigued by the floor. Um, like in, I realized that when I shone, when I shine, when I shone, shine, shone, whatever, the the touch light on the floor, there's like this this reflection on the on the wall that could evoke certain certain emotions 
so I started pouring water and things like that. Um, and through that process of pouring water and playing with lamps and all that, right, I realized I'm trying to recreate a landscape. Uh, okay. uh, anyway, the, this work is, as you can tell, a sound work um, as well as a, as a visual work. And the, the gist is really, you know, um, the darkness kind of, for me, reference all this unknown the anxiety that we all have around COVID. Um, mm. But I do hope, like, when people, when the people are there, when the viewers were there, some of them just stayed and watched ice dripping. Right. Yeah, and is this cool to the present moment, this cool, this return to, to themselves that I want them to remember, that I hope that they'll remember that even though things may seem chaotic, things may seem like we're all in the dark, but it's always possible to, to maybe find this state of lightness, of calm. And then, um, and then we'll just get by, I hope. <laughs> That's a lovely way of running. I'd say that like, it's so interesting thing, like seeing that as a, as a recent body of work. And like, I don't know of a single, like, I could draw a comparison to the amount of time you spent in a dark room and then being in a cave. <laughs> I mean, that's quite, a, that's quite an easy, that's quite an easy comparison. But like your work, it seems to be so occupied with sense, mm. a sense of a landscape, whether it's seeing through it or experiencing the physicality of it or just listening and, in, in, and like, you know, preventing yourself from seeing and just experiencing the atmosphere of silence. There's something within within that that I think. This is a bit of a loaded question. Do you do you identify yourself as a photographer? Uh, mm, depends on the context. Like, if I need to apply for an arts grant, I do say I'm a photographer. <laughs> I'll be <laughs> anything you want me to be. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it's because I, th I often think that like the term photography or photographer is so limiting to so many people's practices um but i think in in photography at the very least it seems that the this community that we're a part of there seems the term artist seems to be a really kind of dirty word for a lot of people but they, they seem to really struggle with the term artist and it's like I think it was Richard Hugo, the poet, that described himself as a landscape poet. That he would go, he would go into a go into a landscape, and he would absorb that experience, and he would try to to disseminate it through his, the written word. Mm. But I, in a in a, in a show, I think that practice isn't of a, absorbing a landscape and trying to personify it into a former part I think it yeah I think that there's uh, there's so many similarities with that process and yours and it's just it's the constant reimagining of the wheel like you could you could make it like this isn't a criticism of her work but Ariska van der Molen is someone that has spent you know decades documenting the landscape um, and she's a landscape photographer but then it's only visual really and I think mm -hmm. that and I think that what you're doing is kind of, it's not too dissimilar, but it's not, it, but it is at the same time. It's, it, it's you're examining one aspect of space and the landscape, but in but attacking it, not just from a visual standpoint, but from a, from a place of self and sense. It's a really, it's really interesting. It's like Richard Long. There's a kind of, there's a, there's a, a multifaceted approach to your practice that I, I find really fascinating. I, I wonder if that's something that has been uh, exacerbated or made, you know, uh, even more intense because of COVID, because you're interacting with people that aren't just photographers and aren't uh, just, you know, dancers, writers, filmmakers. I wonder if it's because you're you're digesting so much different art forms. I think I think I have always been interested in art in paintings and in music and all that, I find it difficult to just stick to one medium. But photography was the easiest medium to me. Just pick up a camera and then like start there, right? Um, but I, I find it interesting that we always, we live across medium. We, we use different mediums to, to in, in our everyday lives. And like, oh, it's like when you listen to music, you see images, right? When you 
look at images, you hear sound, you paint images with your words. It's so it's so intermingling. How do I just cut it out? You know, I, I struggle with that. And that's why I just I just I just play with whatever mediums that I have and right and yeah. I don't know how to just use one part of my senses. <laughs> Well, that's good. You have so many of them. You might as well use as many as you can. Yeah, I mean, since we have it. Really beautiful sentence you've just said is when you look at a photograph, you hear things. And I think, I think that that in itself is a beautiful one line that sums up your practice, is, is that you're making things that visually we look at and we hear, or we hear and then we see or we sense. I, there, there is a kind of a cross sense, I don't know, artistry into your practice which i think is oftentimes forgotten about as photographers because we're so obsessed with how things look <laughs> but not how things feel if that makes sense if that's not if that doesn't get too kind of arty um yeah i think i, th I yeah that's it's a really beautiful way of of, of, of framing it mm, no thank you but i feel i think i think a lot of people are, are i mean i think there are more and more attention giving to how photography feels as getting more yeah i i would say that there's a lot of it seems to me that there's a lot of photography projects that are about how the photographer feels um and i and you know it at times it can come across as slightly self-indulgent you know it's like I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not going to mention any names, but the you know I mean? there seems to be a genre of itself at the moment that's the kind of sad poet in the landscape photographer. Um, and, but uh -huh. like, and I feel like there, there's a potential for any kind of work to go down that route, but yeah. The, the, very rarely do you see a kind of a body of work that's just like, it, it, it's devoid from that and it's just about the experience of something. Um, mm. you know, it's really one, one last question for you. Do you see yourself as an artist? <laughs> uh, and when I sell prints, I do. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It's like I study on a photography course. I teach on a photography course. I'm defined everywhere as a photographer. I have imposter syndrome like everybody else. Um, I, the, the, the genre of photography that I'm attributed with is documentary photography, but it's a term that I think every documentary photographer hates. Um, my, at least with my work, I try to see the bigger picture in something. And oftentimes that um, involves a leap of faith in terms of concept. And so to call myself a documentary photographer is too grounded in realism. Um, and I, I guess all my work is concerned with like, I don't know what real is and nobody really does. So yeah, I think, I think the term artist is still maybe a dirty word in my mind because it's like I, art wasn't something that was afforded to me growing up and so I always had a perception of it as like inaccessible and um, elitist if I'm being completely honest but the more time that I hear myself talk about things that I'm interested in, it's so obvious that I'm into art and I just I wonder if I just have a massive chip on my shoulder I like to think about things I don't like to be told about things. And I think I think if, if that means I'm more of an artist than I am a photographer, then I'm definitely an artist. Maybe we should just say we are just human beings, you know, trying to search for answers. <laughs> We're just human beings that make things for people to experience. Yeah, I think that's like the most truthful, right? I think so. I think so. I, I, I think, um, I don't know, the, the, there's always there's always been an importance to for you to define yourself and for other people to define you but i feel like it's got worse because of how connected we are and how compartmentalized things are socially digitally and you know but yeah i one of the things that i do love about photography or at least hearing people talk about their projects is i don't necessarily care so much about people's images but i love the ideas that people have about their projects or like certainly when talking to students it's like oh i've got this idea and it's like how often do you get to hear you know a project that's about this and then this in the same day and it's just mm. i think it's uh you know to, uh, to to 
you know, not to, to hit home the kind of the analogy of like uh, senses, but I feel like it, it does give people a, a tool to express themselves in, a, in an environment where nobody feels like that they, they're being heard. And I quite like that, that we have, we have, we have an out for whatever's in our head. Um, yeah, I think that's essential. But yeah, explaining to like it's funny explaining to my my my, my favorite test of whether I've gone too far is is if I tell my mother about a project, and if she goes what, then <laughs> I say so, okay, <laughs> okay I've gone too deep. I need to I need to reel it back in. Um, so she she's your barometer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she she keeps me like not going too far into the conceptual kind of. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for this. this has been a really lovely conversation no thank you jack uh, all the best for your teaching and all that i hope things are well in bristol yeah it's, i mean we're recording this on the 9th of march and so this is the day after there was a big interview last night with the queen's grandson harry and Meghan markle so the whole world at the moment is talking about this so it feels like the uk is also exploding from <laughs> the pandemic brexit and now the royal family so it's nice. It's nice to escape to Singapore and hear about your practice. <laughs> um, I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to stop.